planning board. Um, we have a quorum <coughs> of five tonight. And uh, first order of business is approval of minutes. I have two sets of minutes in front of me. Um, they've been distributed to the board and we've had opportunity to make comment and correction. They're from November 7th and November 14th. Does anybody have any comments on the minutes? Okay. Uh, does anybody want to make a motion for approval of the minutes as amended? Move to approve. Okay, so we've got a motion from Gerstel. Do we have a second? Okay, second from Silver. All in favor say aye. 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 Okay, five nothing. That are, is approved unanimously. Next. Not on the pictures. Thanks. What? Not on air. Oh, the on air isn't showing. Well, nothing we can do about that. Uh, just thanks for. Just that people expect us to see it. Right. Should we hold up until uh, we get a no, read on that? Because we have a okay. Video regardless, right? All right. So next order of business is public participation. Uh, this is the time when members of the public who have any comments on items that are not on the public hearing agenda uh, for tonight can address the board. We have um, only one public hearing item tonight, which is a concept plan and review for development of a site at 2400 and 2450 Central Avenue here in Boulder. Um, are there any members of the public who wish to speak to the board about any subject other than that? Okay, so we have no public comment for the general public participation section, so we'll now move on to a discussion of dispositions, planning board call-ups, and continuations. I'm gonna turn it over to Charles so we have one call up this evening. It is a wetlands permit for the Boulder Reservoir Water Treatment Facility Outlet Project. Uh, call up for this particular item ends this evening. Kristen Shepard um, from our uh, flood utility is here to respond to any questions. Any members of planning board have any questions about this call up? Nope. I'll, I'll ask one question okay. and that is, um, <clears throat> will the uh, levy be closed to the public for a certain amount of time during construction? Um, do we have a handle on that? If you don't mind, thank you, since you came in. Appreciate it. So, Kristen Shepard, Flood and Wetland Administrator, hello. Um, the, there's a access road on top of the levy or nearby and that's, they're not closing that road. They're gonna um, have it halfway open to do uh, work on one side and then close the other half oh. and do half on the other. The levee itself, um, it's a very small portion of it and it's further away from the beaches so it shouldn't impact any of the residents using. Okay, great. Yeah, yeah I know it's used for races and yeah. runners and everything, so okay, thank you. Yeah. One more? Sure. Yeah, excuse me, uh, now that we have the opportunity. Sure. So this is being built in connection with the new uh, pipeline that, that'll carry Carter Lake water. How much water is expected to continue to flow through the existing canal uh, um, once this is in operation? I don't know that answer specifically. I'd have to ask the engineers that are doing the pipeline project, um, but I'm happy to follow up with them if you'd like. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Anything else? Okay. Thanks, Kristen. Thank you. Appreciate it. Yeah. Okay, so we're not gonna call that up. So um, let's move on to the public hearing uh, items for the night. Uh, first one is our concept plan and review for 2400, I guess it said 2450 in the agenda here when I read it wrong, it's 2400 and 2405. It is 50. Oh, it is 50, okay, so I read it right. Um, and uh, without going into this too much, I'll just turn it over to um, Charles to Take us away. Great, good evening members of the board. Elaine McLaughlin, our case manager, will present staff's analysis this evening as well as the uh, key issues that we've identified. Great, thanks Charles. Good evening everyone. Uh, good evening. As you all probably know, concept plan differs from site review in that there's no formal action that's gonna be taken this evening. It's really intended as a dialogue between planning board, staff, and the applicant. Um, we look at items such as circulation, general architectural patterns, environmental uh, preservation, um, and it's intended to hear from members of the public who wish to address the board. So we're gonna start with a broad context. Um, hopefully most of you know this is located in East Boulder between Arapahoe and 
Pearl Parkway just off of 55th in uh, the Flatiron Business Park. And so when we take a look at the aerial, we can see that um, the particular site we're looking at is in that northeastern portion of the business park. And uh, this is essentially an area that's been built out since the 1960s. Um, most of the buildings were built by Wright in the Flatiron Business Park. Um, and it, in the aerial, it's actually helpful to see the um, myriad of uses that surround this site in this context, everything from the nearby Stasio ball fields. There's industrial that surrounds to the west, south, and east. And a little further south are the offices, service, commercial, retail, and restaurants of that uh, 55th and Arapahoe area. And then further out, of course, is the Municipal Golf Course, Boulder Jewish Commons, the Boulder Dinner Theater, and other uses like that. So it's just a pretty broad mix of uses in the area. And then this same applicant also received site plan, uh, or rather site review approval in 2017 for that area that's on the southern portion of the Flatiron Business Park for, if you can see it, this small corner um, for a, a brand new building that's intended to go in, hopefully in the next year, they're just about to embark on building permits. So in terms of transit, um, the site served by both regional RTD Flatiron Flyer 6 bus that goes all the way from Union Station downtown and routes through other regional stops, as well as um, the local 206 and 208 buses. And then um, when we look at the comp plan and zoning for the Flatiron Business Park, they're both in industrial, the business park's light industrial for land use, and it's defined as consisting primarily research and development light manufacturing and assembly, media or storage or other intensive employment uses, residential and other complementary uses are encouraged in appropriate locations. And then the zoning is general industrial, which is where a wide, wide range of light industrial, including research and development manufacturing. <coughs> and similarly, it says residential and other complementary uses may be allowed in appropriate locations. And then it's also helpful if we zoom in a bit to the site at 2,450 Central, um, there's also a relatively narrow band of open space other OSO land use that aligns that eastern portion of the business park that appears to encompass part of that riprap slope along the property line and that's um, also a portion of the business park and parking lot. Uh, the property to the east is owned by the city. It's managed by multiple city departments and is designated open space acquired. We looked through city records to try and figure out why this narrow strip wasn't also acquired um, and, or whether it's a mapping error, but we didn't come up with anything per se. Um, so we'll talk a little bit more about that in key issues. Um, under the BBCP, the OSO is defined as applying to other public and private land uses designated prior to 1981 that the city and county would like to preserve through various methods by itself. This designation does not ensure open space protection. And the designation applies to linear features such as water features with the intent that it follow that linear feature. Then in terms of the transportation master plan for bike and pedestrian facilities for the area, it illustrates both the existing multi-use paths that are shown in solid green and then the dashed green is the proposed multi-use paths. The sidewalks that are existing are shown in yellow or light yellow. Um, there's also um, important to note that there's this plan line for a multi-use path connection that goes from Central Avenue up to the existing multi-use <coughs> path that aligns Boulder Creek. And then there's also a funny little um, extension. If I can get over there, I'll move my cursor. But up in the um, up in the properties to the north, there's a little link there that's shown, but it doesn't appear to connect anything. And then there's also an existing linkage that goes from central to uh, the trail that circul circumnavigates around Koa Lake. So there's um, some existing um, multi-use paths as well as proposed. And then in terms of floodplain context, portions of the Flatiron Business Park, including sort of where you can see the concept plan area, are within the 100 and 500 year floodplain for South Boulder Creek. And as you can see in this broad view, um, the 100 year is the, the dark, darker, deeper blue. 
when we move into the site itself that's planned for redevelopment at uh, 2400 and 2450, it's predominantly out of the floodplain, except you can see there's an area of 100-year floodplain on the east end of the site. Um, the map shows a very slight encroachment of conveyance zone onto the property at the very top of the slope of the berm. Um, the applicant's not intending to go anywhere near there, but as noted in the memo, this flood control berm is not actually a registered or certified levy with U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, um, for which there would be very specific regulations. You can see the conveyance zone is shown in bright green and the high hazard, which is shown in pink, and those are on the sort of that leeward, downward side within the creek corridor. And then uh, when we look at the built context, there's approximately 14 acres that are contiguously owned by the applicant. And for that two acre lot area, two lot area um, that's proposed for redevelopment, that's about four acres. And you'll note that um, these office buildings were mostly built in the 70s and 80s, classic suburban office park, large fields of parking surrounded or adjacent to buildings, and then large lawn areas. There is some mature landscaping here and there mature trees. Um, the site intended for redevelopment um, was annexed into the city in the 70s, and there's um, a couple separate by identical buildings that are sort of these U-shaped buildings that are surrounded by parking on three sides. It's essentially these long U-shaped buildings, and there's a little central courtyard that leads to individual offices today. And you can see there's also um, existing essentially small loading docks and parking adjacent to the site. Uh, for the project, the applicant's proposing to average the flow area across multiple sites, leveraging those unbuilt portions of the maximum FAR to build a new building on the site. Um, and the table illustrates that there's an uh, overall allowable flow area of around 311,000 square feet across <coughs> those 14 acres at a 0.4 FAR. And as proposed with the new building, the total build out would be around 297,000. Um, so about 14,000 less than the maximum FAR. Um, and as part of the planned improvements, the applicant's also proposing to implement several sidewalk improvements throughout the overall site, connecting to existing sidewalks and the multi-use path that aligns Boulder Creek. Um, and again, we'll talk about that a little bit in our um, key issues. In terms of a mechanism for averaging flow area across multiple building sites, the land use code only permits this under a site review application, and it's considered a modification to intensity standards. So onto the um, site, it's the applicants proposing to demo the existing twin office buildings and construct a new 144,000 square foot building. It's three stories planned. Um, which is essentially two perpendicular wings that are interconnected by that second story walkway, as you can see in a roof deck. Uh, the preliminary building materials include metal and wood with a metal screen and storefront windows. So for key issues, we have a couple of them, um, some really bigger uh, picture items that um, we'd like planning board to consider. For this first key issue, as was noted in the context slides, there's that proposed TMP multi-use path connection on the southernmost property. And implementation of the plan line, as we noted, could be pretty challenged by a couple of different factors. First, there's that existing flood control berm that's located in the alignment of the plan line, and it is essentially 17% slope, so it'd be pretty difficult mm. to achieve ADA access in this location. <coughs> and it's probably best visualized by this image, which is just taken a little bit north to this site. Really, the only way to uh, get up and over that berm is for stairs. So it could be challenged by trying to construct an actual ADA accessible plan line. So not only is it topo topographically steep, but any connection could also impact the conveyance zone for South Boulder Creek. And to get ADA access, you'd likely have to traverse that berm to get up to that point. So given the fact that it's pretty challenging to make that connection to meet both city and FEMA standards for flood, um, staff suggesting maybe there would be opportunities to locate this in a different location. There's a spot a little further to the north 
um, where it doesn't appear to be in the conveyance zone, but of course survey work would need to be done to confirm this. Um, in speaking with Kristen, our flood plain engineer, she did note that the flood planes are, are mapped pretty accurately in GIS, but the aerial photo can be off somewhat, so we would need to map this to ensure that it's out of the conveyance zone to make that connection, but also it could be an opportunity to do something creative like a bike ramp with stairs to accommodate the steepness, and then you wouldn't be impacting that berm. You would be able to maintain that grade but it would be considered an amendment to the TMP, which has other considerations and may involve additional input from um, our transportation um, board. So in terms of key issue number two, staff outlined some policies that this appears to be consistent with, of course, things like um, doing redevelopment as infill to maintain that compact development pattern, and then revitalizing commercial and industrial areas that our comp plan supports. For future considerations, we also outlined some that the applicant may want to take a look at, um, some related to how the building addresses the public realm, but these are things that could be worked out in a more fine grain. Really, it's these larger issues of looking at um, things like connectivity and then, of course, use, because the light industrial areas are probably opportunities to do infill and get a greater mix of uses. It's sort of a monoculture, as you all know. Today, it's a nine to five, Monday through Friday or eight to five minute <coughs> folks leave. And then there's maybe opportunities to infill over time and the applicant probably should consider this for some of these other properties and look at ways of doing retrofitting more residential, more retail. That's not what's under consideration today, but of course, concept plan's a great opportunity to consider this over time. And as another side note, um, staff is considering doing some code changes that could make um, adaptability and flexibility with other uses over time a little bit easier than it is today. So with that um, concludes staff's presentation. Are there any questions? Yeah, Sarah? Um, so I'm going to uh, ask uh, some of the questions that I emailed to you. Um, I had asked about density transfer to try to understand the um, <clears throat> the applicant's request to expand um, what's allowed on those two sites and the implications for the other mm -hmm. five or six parcels. So could you just um, walk us through uh, what it means for them to transfer, this may be the wrong legal language, but to transfer the density from other sites to those two parcels and what does that mean in the future for development on those other parcels? Sure, good question. So as I had pointed out, and there was a previous slide and I provided it in response to your question, um, only through site review can you average across multiple sites. You can average FAR only through site review and it's considered a modification to intensity standards. So there's that piece and then um, it's essentially that averaging and rather than uh, transfer, there's not really a transfer of density per se. <coughs> However, this whole site as a site review now becomes united through that site review. So any future changes would have to be considered with that maximum FAR that's established through this site review. So in other words, those other particular sites would likely not be able to redevelop the only exception is there's 14,000 square feet that would be remaining based on the concept as it is today. So they would only be able to add or change things up to 14,000 square feet. And may I just follow up? And does, if they, so, the site review is for these seven or eight contiguous parcels. If the applicant were to sell off after this is built, any of these parcels, are those parcels still subject to the limitations? Absolutely. Yeah, so it's all united. Okay, Despite Thanks. any That's future very ownership changes or what have you. Okay. Um, <coughs> you mentioned some, at the very end there, some potential zoning changes in the works. Would that be in conjunction with the um, East Boulder area plan? Is that what we're thinking or? You know, um, I know that this was something that was targeted after the comp plan. Um, suggested maybe infill would be a good opportunity. And I, I know with the pressure of the jobs to housing imbalance, 
to get more residential. This looks like easy opportunities to maybe retrofit some of these more suburban types of office parks with uses that could maybe adapt over time. But my understanding is 2020 was the year when it was targeted to take a look at code changes for residential and industrial zoning districts. Yeah, and that's something, uh, Dave, that'll occur through the East Boulder sub-community plan. Yeah. Right, and if, um, if uh, the site re review were to come before that area plan is finalized, then we wouldn't have that as a tool to right. analyze this project. Right. Okay. Not until it's adopted. Okay, um, I had more, but um, right. shall I? Okay, so could you explain to me um, if, if, if we went to a site review with this um, TMP proposal for a connection and we decided to do a connection, uh, that, um, that comes with um, opportunities to work with the applicant to upgrade some stuff on their property and maybe the city does development on access to the levy or whatever. Um, so, but we, are, we do have an opportunity to share costs of this with the applicant, is that correct? Which is why we want to really understand it, or how, how does that work? Well, if I understand your question, if there's a TMP plan line shown within an area that's considered for site review, the applicant's required to implement that ah. plan line. So they would need to implement it based on DCS standards. So okay. given that that's not tenable in this location because of the levy, chances are it would be an amendment to the DCS as well as the TMP. And so it would require a bigger process per se to either move it or to make some sort of amendment that would say we would use stairs with a bike rail going up the stairs or something like that. So it, so there's a little bit of process to do. It's not that easy to achieve this plan line is the bottom line. Mm -hmm. Okay. And um, wait, just while I'm on that, uh, the to the um, south uh, between, I think, uh, I want to say 2200 and 2100, there's actually a, a concrete uh, ramp that goes up a little, about halfway. <laughs> uh, and uh, that one is right where the Stasio uh, uh, intersection is pretty much. Hmm. So that was interesting to me when I was walking around the site. Is um, it the one that, that's just? A yeah, I think it's the dotted line below the circle. So it's not on this site. So I don't know if anyone's looked at that also. Well, given uh, that it's not part of the site Inside, view yeah, area, yeah. It's, it's not something that could be implemented. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay, thank you. I wanna um, just follow up on that. Has, I, I haven't seen the entirety of that levy or how it works or, or anything, but has anybody considered putting the, the uh, multi-use path on top of it? So, so there is a multi-use path that exists today on top of the levy and that's actually the South Boulder Creek multi-use path. So the intent is to take that dash line and connect to that solid line, which is an existing multi-use. Okay, okay, understood. Um, well, Don? Yeah, I, uh, just to pursue that, uh, the path issue, I'm trying to, I understand the, the difficulty with the ADA considerations, but I don't understand the reluctance of having some sort of a, uh, an angled path traversing along the levee to gain the, the elevation that, that is necessary. Well, it seems like such an obvious and simple thing to do that. Uh, I think the I, challenge is when we, when we look at having to traverse it, and let me see if I can get the cursor there, but this whole area in green is conveyance. So anytime you impact that conveyance zone, it's remapping under uh, Mike Flood, and it impacts everything upstream from there and is likely not feasible from a regulatory standpoint in terms of both FEMA and city flood standards. So the idea is to just avoid trying to impact the conveyance zone and look for other opportunities where it's more low-hanging fruit for connectivity to that multi-use path. Well, I, uh, I, I respect your point. I, I still think that it may be appropriate to consider the options for an angled path going to gain that altitude. It's, it's not obvious to me that all options would, would have that impact. Um, but the, the other 
related aspect that I'm pondering is the OSO area, which I know there's generally a bit of discussion about and what its fate is. It seems to me that that OSO area is also relevant here because that is also in the, uh, in one of the relevant uh, flood, the, the either the 100 year or the, uh, mm -hmm. oh, all right, you have it there. Yeah. And so I'm trying to understand how consideration of that OSO uh, intrusion that exists now, if I understand correctly, uh, would pertain to both the, uh, the flood classification and the potential for a, a path getting up to the, the bikeway. Yeah, the, my understanding is the location of that OSO, and let's just go back to this image if I can come up with it readily, is it, it encompasses the flat area, so no matter what, you still would have to somehow breach this berm with some sort of grading to, to get up to the top. And so it's not just the conveyance zone that's the challenge, but it's also impacting the flood control aspects of the burn, berm and the integrity of the flood control of the berm. So in some ways, having that stair step that gets your bike up there maintains that existing grade going up the berm and is less impactful. Um, to the north, as I had pointed out, there there is that existing connection that goes um, directly to that Koa Lake. So there is an existing multi-use path. It's, it's, it's like the berm comes back down and so you don't have to, you're not challenged by grade in that location. Right. Okay. Well, I'm, you know, I think it's great to look at all options. I have to say with these berms and their classification, uh, I understand this was Harold Short and Flatirons companies who developed these just like in CU South area. Mm -hmm. He was a master at building berms without getting a core certification, it seems to me, mm -hmm. in the city and getting the city to accept them mm -hmm. in that uh, way. Anyway. Okay. Okay, Sarah. Can I just ask um, to, on this map, for you to indicate to us, and I realize we can't apply the East Boulder community, uh, sub-community plan <coughs> to our discussions, but where uh, along Arapahoe Avenue, <coughs> there's likely to ultimately be a transit center, just so we can get a sense of. Yeah, I, I'd have to look that up. Okay. I don't have that readily, but we'll look it up while we're uh, as, I think that just would be helpful as we talk about mm -hmm. all of this. Thank you so much. Sure. Any more questions for staff? I bet we have a, John? I, I just have a question to follow up on, on what Sarah was inquiring about before with say, say this were to be sold off and uh, how that gets dealt with in the future. If, if that were to happen, is there some sort of a, a revision made to property uh, title documents that indicate that in the future th the issues that you described would be sure to be... Yeah, uh, it shows up in title when yeah. there's an e existing oh. discretionary review. Right, so the development agreement will be recorded so it'll pop up in the title work. I see. Good. Okay, Lupita. So going back to the possibility of having maybe this rezone so we have more businesses and potentially housing nearby, how feasible is it to be within the 15 minute walking distance from other areas so that whatever comes in really kind of fits that? Yeah, that's a really good point. Well, um, again, if you look at this map and reference Arapahoe and 55th, there's quite a bit of um, existing services there. And so it's certainly within 15 minutes from this location in Flatiron Business Park to get to 55th and Arapahoe, and the visioning that's coming out of the East Boulder um, <coughs> area plan would probably augment what's going on at 55th and Arapahoe to hopefully make that more amenable to infill and, and densifying that as a more of a neighborhood center. Mm -hmm. Something to think about, too. Okay. All done with questions for staff? I bet the applicant has a presentation.
Hello, um, I'm Amanda Johnson with Oz Architecture. Good to see you guys again. Um, this is a really fun project for us to work on and it's especially fun because of all of the changes that we and our client have helped kind of create in this office park that's been redeveloping since the 60s. Um, I think some of the things that we find are also things that you guys are bringing up in terms of connectivity. These, these buildings are really like isolated little islands that have small ways to circulate, mostly for vehicles throughout the site. And um, our client, a couple years ago engaged us to create a master plan for this whole um, community, this whole neighborhood. And in that, we've identified ways to help increase pedestrian connectivity, vehicular like connectivity or transportation, um, connect to public transportation, as well as opportunities for mixed, mixed uses, retail, potentially residential. Um, and I'll just say wherever the right forum is, it's probably not right now, but our client is really eager to participate with the city in creating a mix of uses here um, that right now just aren't allowed in um, the zoning. So I think in the future, as we start to identify other parcels in our master plan that are really ideal for things like residential, um, there's a really great conversation that could be had to help benefit this neighborhood as well as um, our residents and our employees. So with that said, we'll dig into some of the visioning around this site. Um, so as part of the master plan effort, one of the things that we've identified, especially with these locations, is that they're really talked back in the context of this um, office park. So the idea in, that we have maybe residential, as a point of conversation was one that we didn't think was as strong in this location for the future just because it was really far back to try to find those um, those spaces. And so in terms of maximizing opportunity, it felt like redeveloping and, and creating a more um, urban, if you will, office front along this location might help really increase the connections throughout the site. So um, as Elaine had describe to you guys what we've really tried to do with this uh, site plan is increase connectivity to the extent that we can between parcels that we own um, from a, a pedestrian and vehicular mode. Our client is working with a Boulder B-Cycle to also implement different B-Cycle stations along the loop so that we create more connections for um, mixed uh, mixed mode transportation also to the path. So um, some of the, as we started to look at this site, we really wanted to be macro in terms of affecting positive change to the places that we could. So we started to envision this neighborhood as a campus of buildings and we don't own all of the campus, but the ones that we do control and that we can try to create better connectivity between, we're really proposing those linkages, whether it be sidewalks or different amenity spaces. There's a lot of um, food trucks that house in different areas around this site, so creating areas of, of congregation for that type of amenity to draw um, people together is part of is, is part of our macro view. And we also recognize that the multi-use path runs above us and is, is complicated in terms of grading, but to the people that work there every day, that's such an amazing resource. And we like the idea of trying to create a better connection from that path into the park so that people don't necessarily have to take a car from their home to work every day. Um, we also recognize the idea that amenities come in a lot of different forms and fashions. They come in retail hubs, they come in um, covered places to have lunch. And so because these sites historically have been really big and a lot of parking, trying to come up with ways to utilize that ground surface area, we don't have a lot of allowable FAR to develop. So these sites won't be fully developed um, in terms of the footprint. So. 
figuring out how we can take the idea of making a, con a campus connected with um, overhead paths or slowing down different intersections in that yellow zone, creating this promenade feel in, in different areas so that gathering places can happen out in what is a parking lot at times is part of our um, strategy. The massing is continuing to evolve and we are, we've branded, if you will, this office park as um, think, innovate, and create. And a lot of the tenants that come in here are, are really from that kind of industrial background where they're creating new things and creating innovating products. Upslope has its um, main location here. And we developed the first Colorado's, Boulder has that, Colorado's first cross-laminated timber office building a few years ago. I don't know if you guys have driven by that at Flatiron Park. It was with this client, but it's the first um, all wood office building and wood as in construction material is the only rapidly renewable means of construction. And so in this, op in this project, we see it as another opportunity to innovate in how we can um, create really different spaces and unique buildings uh, in this, as an example, we're starting to explore the idea of prefabricated um, wall panels that are created off-site and assembled on-site so that in a market that has really expensive construction costs, we can still deliver a really well-articulated um, facade. Also, the idea that we have glazing that's pushed back to allow the sun to, sh or the building itself to shadow the um, glazing and then having vertical louvers to help support the sun. And because this building has the opportunity to create these outdoor spaces, allowing little um, decks or pocket parks within the building itself is part of our um, concept. We're evaluating exactly how the building is positioned on the site. This is an evolution of what's in your packet and what we submitted for concept, but almost flip-flopping the building so that we can take advantage of our great flat iron views here and also allow our passive solar strategies to be implemented to the facade. You'll see in the arrow that's in the center of the building really creating a link between the adjacent buildings to our site and how that disperses around the campus this as well. Um, some of the strategies in terms of how the form is starting to evolve and erode and carve, because these buildings historically are set back from the street, we're trying to respect the different um, vocabularies that are around us, but also not have a monotonous three-story volume that's right up against our sidewalk, and so creating a base middle and a top and allowing glass to kind of crawl through the atrium and not be a whole glass box building, but really start to push and pull and create interesting forms that way. Um, this is an example of how we're starting to study and innovate the, the wall systems and the panelized systems so that they can come and, and again, we can afford a lot of different variety in our facade that is um, of a high quality material but also interesting architecturally. And some reference images for you all that we're starting to use again with the um, wood that we've used on the other project just to down the street and exposing some of the structure to the idea of cantilevering our building and creating some promenade and paseo spaces. And then um, again, some views of how that building starts to feel along the street where it's broken up into say one building plus a connector and the other building and relates to the streetscape of the smaller buildings adjacent to us. Um, this is the center, one of the things that we're really trying to innovate here. You can kind of see it in the middle where you see transparent wood volumes, but exploring and continuing to innovate on how the wood that we used in the first building can come and create a structural but also um, somewhat poetic roof assembly. And then how the different spaces are starting to stack and create outdoor amenities for our users. Flip through these um, and again, respecting the beautiful view that we'll now have on our third floor. I, just some interior shots, but 
ultimately, I think we're really proud to have our name connected to this project. We're also excited to continue to show um, future development at Flatiron Park, how it can connect to adjacent sites and create an even better campus for office users. And to the point where whenever the right time is or whatever the right forum is to have a, a productive dialogue with our developer and the city to meet some of those residential or mixed use needs, we would be all ears for. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Well, it's our chance to ask some questions of the applicant if we'd like. Does anybody have one? David? Sure. Um, you mentioned right at the beginning uh, that you would be, um, or the applicant would be uh, in general, you and the owner, would be um, will looking, willing to look at different uses um, if allowed by zoning. Um, I, I don't want to necessarily put you on the spot, but I know that currently with use review or other conditional uses, you, you can get um, residential and uh, small uh, brew pubs and restaurants and things in these uh, zones. So did you have anything specific in mind? Um, yeah, I believe, and again, correct me, um, you guys, but I believe that the brew pub kind of component is only when it's connected to a production facility. So okay. like Upslope has their tap room that's connected to theirs. Ozo has their coffee shop that's connected to theirs. There's only one building, which is the deli right now is what it's called, that is allowed um, in the whole PUD or the, the original development of Flatiron Park that was allowed to be retail as an example. So there are things in those conditions and use of guidelines that make it a little difficult in this zone for I, you? I don't believe it's allowed outside of those specific examples. Okay, okay. Well. And if I might also add, the residential can only be an industrial when it is has one-sixth contiguity with other residential or is across from or adjacent to a city park. So in this case, it wouldn't apply as well. So that's some of the amendments that need to be considered. Yeah. To make something like that happen in this. So case. yeah, it's in, it, it's in, it looks from the use table like you could do it, but then yeah, you have to read further into the uh, narratives behind that. Okay, thank you, yeah. Okay. John, you had something? Yeah, uh, I was wondering, it looks like there's a, a large amount of parking associated with the proposal. How does that change from what's there now in terms so of So right now the, uh, we're aligning with the um, zoning requirements for parking. And so if, we, if the city had us, had a request to, um, our intent is to align with what is required per zoning today. I see. But the idea that we have planned for these spaces to be designed to be like paseos or public community event spaces, like that type of design um, flexibility is top of mind so that in the future, if we don't have as many cars, that um, it can be dual purposed. Because like I said, the FAR doesn't really allow us to really maximize development on the site. So we just need to be smart about planning for future uses. Okay. And the, uh, I also note that uh, in the OSO uh, portion of, of your land, mm -hmm. you aren't proposing any construction. Is, do I understand correctly? At this point, cor you're correct in that. Um, at, at the current stage of our development, yes. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. No more questions for the applicant? Okay, thank you. Okay, so staff's given us a couple of key issues to look at and for guidance we can also look to the um, criteria for... Public comment? Yeah, Public oh comment. yeah, sorry. Kurt, you're here. I'm here. <laughs> okay, so we'll, we'll take public comment right now and I think we have one person signed up. I'm not actually signed up, but I'll sign up. Well, you are now. That's okay. <laughs> okay <laughs> Just state your name for the record. Yeah, Kurt Nordbeck, uh, 777 Delwood Avenue. Speaking on behalf of uh, Community Cycles, we sent you a letter um, about this, and we feel very strongly that it's important that there be an improved connection of some sort uh, in association with this development. As we mentioned, there are a number of connections to the Boulder Creek Path and the South Boulder Creek Path that exist. All of them are sub 
optimal <laughs> in various different ways, all in different ways, but they're all bad basically um, in one f form or another. And so coming up with a, a, a proper connection we feel is very important and especially one that goes towards the south. So the only, uh, towards the south uh, of the, the south, the south direction of the South Boulder Creek path, the only real sort of connection is just a social path that goes over mud and rocks uh, currently. There are two actually stairs. We mentioned one there, uh, I went by and looked at it today. There are two, I believe, stairs that exist, but of course those are not ADA comp compatible, compliant and not good for bikes. Um, so uh, we would um, certainly support, John suggested an angled path up the berm, and I, I think that we, we didn't talk about that specifically, but I think that we would be all in favor of that. We, I think, would have some concerns about the stairs with a, a bike ramp because that could be difficult, especially with a heavy, more and more people are using e-bikes, and which are heavy and could be difficult to push up and down a ramp like that. Um, plus, it's still not ADA compliant. So there are concerns there. Um, the, I will I correct one thing that sounded not quite right, that the, the, the path is not always exactly on top of the berm. Where the connection to down to Stasio is, it goes down into the conveyance zone, right? And then kind of back up. So it would be possible conceptually to reroute the path to stay on the top of the berm there. And I think that would keep it out of the conveyance zone then, and then there would just have to be some separate connection down to, to Stasio. But that might be something to be considered. The last thing I'll point out is that uh, it's in a lot of these connection plans, and I I'm, I'm, can't remember exactly what the terminology is in the transportation master plan, but for example, in the transit village area plan, the TVAP uh, connections plan, they talk about the, the alignments as conceptual, right? And so it's not like, it has to be on that exact line. And so I think there could be flexibility. Uh, so those are our thoughts. Basically, we just wanna make sure that this doesn't escape without having a proper connection. Okay, thank Thanks, you. Thanks, Kurt. Um, we stay ask, up for a second. Uh, yeah. A couple of things. Um, first of all, um, uh, does community cycles um, have an opinion about the idea of steps with a uh, place uh, to roll your bike up next to the steps if that were uh, kind of needed to be done? That, that was mentioned a couple times. Right. That's that's what I was referring to. I think that yeah. we did not discuss that di uh, directly, okay. but I think given the increased usage of e-bikes, which are heavy, as yeah, I was saying, I think that that's not. Okay ideal and something that you can actually ride up and down and also you could take a wheelchair up and down of course Sorry. would be preferable. Yeah, sorry if I missed that. And then the other thing I wanted to ask with the regard to the conveyance zone, the conveyance zone we're worried about is on the west side of the uh, berm, is that not correct? Uh, the, there is a conveyance zone on the west side? Um, let's see if I can get to that image. It's, um, let's see a bit further along here. It is on the west side in this location um, where it would have to connect. So that's the challenge of connecting in this location. I'd be interested um, to learn where you were talking about that it comes back down out of the conveyance. If, if I may, I... Yep. I, th where I'm seeing the conveyance zone, the divider between the conveyance zone and the 100-year floodplain is on the top of the berm there. Is that it, not? It's actually, right? it's right here. So right. there's, that's right. the 100-year and then that's and that the, is and the, this is the multi-use path. So that's at the top right. of the berm. So we would have I, to grade in the conveyance zone. But uh, if you look at the, the um, Topo lines there, the multi-use path is not actually on the top of the berm. That's what I was referring to. It goes down into basically that little floodplain and then back up. So there, if the if the path were along the line between the conveyance zone and the hundred year floodplain, then it would be really on top of the berm. 
the, the place where, it, um, I'm sorry, is it okay if I, the, the place where it goes down to the um, path over to Stasio though, that's on the east side, I believe, of the berm. Uh, so it's across that the That is berm. on the east side of the berm, right. It goes right. to the east of the berm, into right. the conveyance zone. But I think that where the conveyance zone that's a uh, concern for access on the west side mm -hmm. uh, is a different conveyance zone than you're talking about, because you're talking about the actual creek, I think. Okay, uh, maybe I'm confused. All I, was, I was looking at that and I was seeing the conveyance zone on the east side of the berm and the 100-year floodplain on the west side of the berm. But there's a conveyance zone on the west side as well, yep, is that That's right, that where correct? it says existing multi-use path just to the west of that or yeah. left of that is still in the conveyance zone. But that is still east of the berm, that's the point. The, the, the top of the berm goes along where it says property line? Yep, and I think the challenge is more around oh. the conveyance zone and being able to put the, the path in through the conveyance zone without impacting upstream. Right, we can't do any grading in the modern. conveyance zone. We can't, there's no improvements that, that can be made. So it's conveyance. really that spot right there that we can't, we can't put any kind of um, facility connecting into the conveyance zone at this point. Okay, well, I don't, I don't want to belabor this, but I, I still believe that if the path were on top of the berm there, then it would be along that property line and it would be then out of the conveyance zone. To, so you're saying to move the existing multi-use path over? Correct, up to the top of the berm. Well, can I just, um, in the place that's in this picture right here, right. it is at the top of the berm. I is it it's south um, down towards Stasio that it's not? Because I, I, I walked I it today. I, I was there today. Yeah, I actually <laughs> climbed up well, today. We can, we can talk about it, but look at, the, look okay. at the, the topo lines there. And you'll see it's crossing the topo line, so it's not at the top. Well, okay, maybe. All right, hold, yeah, but that's let's okay. take Lupita's okay. question now. So I think this brings a good point because there's a little bit of confusion as of what, you know, the the potential changes may need on whether there is. I would like to focus on if there should be some sort of modification and you said it cannot be done. Uh, I'd like to maybe focus a little bit on that. Why cannot be done? Uh, is it a recourse to, is it a, yeah, is, is it an option to maybe modifying things to get it on compliance that will make more sense? Uh, is it such a recourse? Well, I, I think my understanding, and, and I'm not the flood expert, unfortunately, but my understanding is that it's best not to touch conveyance zone um, because of the Mike flood modeling and how it impacts the, the, all the South Boulder Creek modeling further up. It would be untenable. It, it's um, a very long process to model a simple change and so the, the path of least resistance is to look at something as is illustrated on the screen where the circle is, where we don't have to even touch the conveyance. And if it just means shifting that plan line and, and potentially even just shifting um, the ability to put the path up to that point that's in the 100 year rather than the conveyance, it would honestly be much, much easier and less of a challenge. So I, I think rather than looking concretely at because the plan line is drawn here, it has to be here, to look at opportunities and constraints of where it's more reasonable to place it. John? Well, I, uh, I have to say that I understand your point, but I, as, as a water engineer, I think that's exactly the wrong way to deal with modeling. Modeling is there you run the model to see what the impact of changes will be. Uh, you don't stay away from any changes because you're scared of modeling. Uh, in, yeah, in and that, my that, sense that's things. just the so message from our flood plan. I, I am, I, 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 particularly I, sensitive is the Mike flood for South Boulder Creek. I, I, I think I'm aware of the uh, mm -hmm. sensitivity, but nevertheless, the way one uses a model after one has invested a huge amount in developing it seems to me not to be the way you're describing it. But the other thing I was wondering about is, given that these dikes and levees are not certified by the Corps, do we have any intention of either 
getting them reviewed by the Corps to see if they will certify them or to, to, to affect them in any way to improve the uh, flood protection in that area? Not that I'm aware yep. of. Mm -hmm. But I do think that um, getting back to the point about not being concrete about where the plan line has to be, it also t it's also thinking in terms of an existing berm that would be much less impactful if we thought about where else to locate the plan line. And I think it's fair to say that oftentimes when these plan lines are drawn, they're, they're drawn literally on a sheet of paper and, and less um, in dealing with the actual on site or in reality um, considerations. So I think we need to be more open minded about how we shift the plan line rather than saying this is discreetly where it has to be. Well, so following up on that, Elaine, if, if, um, if you can avoid touching green basically, by turning that east-west connector north through the parking lot and linking up with the existing multi-use path in the hatched circle that's drawn. Mm -hmm. And we were being exhorted to read the plan, the transportation master plan, more liberally. Mm -hmm. Couldn't the applicant just come in showing the connection, doing that jog, and say we don't need to update the TMP, we don't need to hold multiple hearings in front of planning board and the board and uh, the city council and OSMP and whoever, you know, because it's liberally interpreted. I think you could find that it meets the intent. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? Um, John? I have one. Uh, the applicant mentioned that they were developing a, a master plan for this area. Um, I think for us to give a, a coherent response, it would be good if we could review the master plan and see the bigger picture that we're uh, sure, expected to sure. consider. Right now, is there any chance of that? Possibly, but right now our code says whatever's contiguously owned, and if they don't own the rest of the property, it would be difficult to have that come in as a concept plan and site review. But hello, what do you think? I think it couldn't be required to be brought forward at this point in time. I, I didn't hear what you said. It couldn't be required to be brought forward at this point in time, but it, it seems like it probably could be something that that the owner could do. Well, I, I, I suggest to the owner and to staff that it would be very useful if we are really to do what we're intending to do here, which is considering the, the bigger picture as well as the details here. I know sure. we're supposed to be in there. So I was just curious in the um, n the proposal, uh, there's a rearranging of parking, uh, and there's the addition of something like 60,000 additional squ square feet of office space. Can you just tell me w what the original number of parking spaces were and what the, n I know the new number is something like 720, but what was the, how, how much, m how many more parking spaces are there planned than currently exist on these two sites? So um, I don't have that handy right here. I do know that what's required is a little less than what they're actually proposing. Mm -hmm. And so our recommendation as part of our site or our concept plan review was that they take a good hard look at actually how many of those numbers they need. Mm -hmm. And it, this is the kind of situation too where I think staff would entertain um, a parking reduction, that there could be a rationale made in the parking reduction criteria in this kind of circumstance, rather than building out additional parking, maybe back away from that. Yeah, I was struck by how much parking already exists in the two buildings to the west that um, the applicant talked about as being a campus, mm -hmm. and um, or part of the campus, and it just struck me that um, sharing some of those some of the sump principles might be well applied here. Questions? Okay. All right, then um, let's move on to, it's not exactly a deliberation, but let's go through um, some of the review criteria and provide some comment. 
So I think uh, we'll start with the key issues. If you can put them up, Elaine, Bet. and um, can we can there. comment on those. And then uh, why don't we just quickly run through the eight review guidelines for um, concept plans after that to see if that shakes loose any additional comments for the applicant. Okay, so um, any consensus on the first bullet point about transportation master plan multi-use path connection? Comments, John? Well, I, I think uh, we, we covered the issues pretty clearly here. Um, I, I would take, I think that if I understood correctly, we agreed that uh, the uh, transportation master plan map could be used in the, uh, in the larger sense rather than the more detailed sense. And as long as there's some connection that gets people onto the multi-use path somewhere in this area, we're not that concerned about exactly where it is. Uh, I, I don't mean to be drawing incorrect assumptions, but that was my perception of the conversation here. David? Um, yeah, my, my concern is when I look at these drawings, um, it's not clear to me that the conveyance zone is being um, very clearly marked for us. And, um, and the way conveyance zones work, my understanding would be if there's a conveyance zone along that um, levee, that it would pretty much run all the way from the, the lake access on the north, because that's where the levee kind of starts, and it would go all the way down to the BNSF, uh, I don't know if I have the acronym right, those railroad tracks to the south, because the, the, the levee goes that entire length, and so if there's a conveyance zone along it, there's gonna be a conveyance zone the whole way. So no matter where we looked, there would be this issue. Uh, and then I look at just a couple properties south and I see um, someone built a concrete platform right smack in the middle of that conveyance zone. Uh, right smack in the middle. So, you know, there's stuff there that, uh, that <laughs> you know, um, is completely um, off the rails in terms of, uh, uh, of what should be allowed in conveyance zones currently. So, so I, I feel like um, we, we would need to, I, I'd like to see a more holistic kind of uh, uh, look at, oh, if we don't do it here, where would we do it? Because I, I think that the, the long, long term we're gonna need a really good bike access uh, in that area. Yep. I don't know if you had any comments on that, Elaine, but. Um, yeah. uh, well, I think that one image that I showed where it appeared as though it was uh, the, the multi-use path moved closer to the 100 year um, and had potential okay. um, for a connection, that would need to be surveyed to be fully accurate and understandable. And as I noted in GIS, some of these layers can shift slightly and yeah. my understanding is the flood layer is pretty accurate but the aerial layer can be off by a few feet here and there. So that's why the survey would be okay. most efficient for determining if we have that kind of location that we can, the sweet spot, so to speak, that we can connect to. Okay. Lupita? I'm gonna piggyback on the conversation. We have kind of like my original comment. Uh, and John following up with the usefulness of modeling. And again, in my own training, modeling is supposed to be the easy way to envision what happens if we do this and we do that. And I'm wondering if there is a possibility of looking at these variabilities or these variable things that we've talked about and have as a requirement that we see this possibilities or possible cases presented to us so that we can actually make a better decision because there may be some problems that will be smaller than others. So it appears that there are quite a few different challenges, but some of them may be easier to deal with than others. So from my perspective, if we can use the modeling um, tools that we have, that would be the easy way to go about it, I think. But then again, I, I, it seems to me that I didn't quite get an idea, I didn't get an idea clearly whether these models that we have are actually doing their job. So did, did, did that reflect a little bit what you were thinking, John, because? Yeah, I think that, that's a very clear explanation. Yeah. We have the modeling 
for a, for a purpose. We aren't locked into whatever the latest model run was. We can use the model to evaluate uh, alternatives. Yeah, so it just said, uh, like I said, from a perspective of somebody who uses models uh, precisely just to have, this is what the results show us that we do this and we do that, and so you have multiple cases run, and we make decisions based on whichever preferable case comes out. Right. Is there somebody that we need to talk to? Could that be one of the requirements? Maybe I'm looking now at the chair. So I, I think, you know, right now what we're doing is trying to give the applicant a sense of, you know, what we see in their concept plan application, and, and I think, you know, we just want to give them a sense of what they ought to come back with for site review. And so, you know, I guess if I can try to sum it up, what I think I'm hearing is that, you know, we're open to a, a number of different concepts. And if, you know, if you do the modeling or you, you, you know, coordinate with a surveyor to figure out where the conveyance zone is, where the, the boundaries of the different flood zones are, um, and how you can most efficiently and attractively and effectively connect the multi-use path, that's fine. Um, and, you know, if, if you want to get crazy and, you know, run the multi-use path up the side of the berm at an ADA compliant angle and you can model it to show that your cut equals your fill and you're not displacing any water and, you know, the, the flood people at the city go, that's fine. God bless. If, um, if you've got a cheaper, easier, you know, more efficient way to do it, that's great too. So. Do, does that make sense? Because yes. I think that's the kind of advice that I think we're here to give on a night like this. Yeah, I think that makes sense. Okay. All right, so let's jump to, uh, unless Sarah had something to say, or John had another thing to say about the multi-use path connection. Yeah, I, uh, I just wanted to mention that I noted that your proposal uh, indicates that there's to be no construction in the uh, open space other portion, and I know that that the fate of that land has often been uh, controversial here and elsewhere, but I, I note that you're not proposing to do anything in there, and I, I think that's excellent, and I encourage you to continue with that uh, approach. Okay, so that, that's a good segue to the second bullet because that has to do with our consistency mm -hmm. with BVCP policies. Um, and uh, so does, does, Sarah, do you wanna start with that? Can I put uh, you on the spot? Uh, you don't, it's Fine, I don't mind being put on the spot. Um, so I had, um, I uh, agreed with uh, many of the um, BVCP uh, goals that the staff identified as um, being in uh, alignment uh, with the project, but I had a few that I felt were not raised and I would like to just put on the table for our discussion. Mm -hmm. One is, um, the jobs housing balance um, and just to curious, uh, uh, there's not there. Um, this is not a challenge to new office office buildings, but um, the fact that a, a large office building really does nothing to address the jobs housing balance and um, this may go to John's point about wanting to see, hoping to see uh, the broader master plan and what the developer, the applicant is thinking. I also had some concerns, and this kind of goes to the parking lot, uh, but what the parking lot represents, which is an awful lot of in-commuters, and uh, I'm concerned about um, whether this project um, it helps Boulder take the steps it's trying to take towards its climate goals, um, and I identified 4.01 and 4.03 and 4.04, um, and also whether um, making it such an, uh, creating uh, such a large parking lot um, does anything to advance our transportation goals of reducing single occupancy vehicle trips. So those were the um, Boulder Valley Comp Plan goals that I thought were not addressed in the proposal and I think are worthy of some discussion. Okay, next, anybody want to talk to the consistency with the comp plan? David? <coughs> um, well, I'll, I'll um, echo what you said. I think that both of those <laughs> Excuse me. Uh, both of those criteria are very important considerations. Um, it frustrates me to see something that I feel doesn't really live up to the vision of, in our comp plan because our zoning currently discourages the mixed use. Um, 
and I would love to be able to say, oh, I would vote no if it were a monoculture of, uh, of offices. Uh, but I don't know that I could do that because uh, if, if the applicant is put in a position that it's unreasonable to propose residences and coffee shops and, and convenience stores integrated into this, um, I, I would be not, I, it wouldn't be fair of me to vote no. Uh, but, but to me, those values in the comp plan are not met by this. Uh, we're taking down two, um, you know, they're ugly buildings. They're, they're not, they're old. They're um, past their useful life in some ways, but they could still be used. So we're, we're, we are demo, demo, um, demolitioning some stuff and putting in something really fabulous. Uh, but, uh, but we're not uh, moving the needle in terms of an area that I think the East Boulder uh, area plan is going to identify as a key place in Boulder that we want to start moving towards walkable neighborhoods with residences in, in, incorporated, with, uh, with businesses. I look, um, I look at the people that work there and I can't help but say, yeah, um, 55th and Arapahoe is pretty close, but still, it's just far enough away that I'll bet a lot of people jump in their cars and drive to meet people for lunch. Uh, and uh, just, fly, just you're just out of the way enough that it just kind of discourages you to kind of hang out and, and do things right in the area that you're working. So, um, so that, that, that frustrates me. And when you, when you take a project this big, um, we're talking decades uh, that we're going to be living with these decisions, right in the middle of the place where we would like to, to change this. So I, I can't, oh my gosh, sorry, something happened. Uh, so I, I can't um, stress enough how important I think it would be for us to see how we could work with the existing zoning and then hopefully the changes that are coming down the pike to see if we can't. Uh, get something a little bit more in line with the BBCP uh, principles on that. Um, in terms of the parking, yeah, I, I think um, I would be totally warm to a parking reduction uh, if that could be justified. And uh, the, there's a lot of other wonderful uses for those that area than putting more parking spaces up. So I would um, definitely support that. Um, let me quickly interrupt and get a show of thumbs on how other board members feel about a parking reduction if it were proposed. Okay. So. Can I just piggyback on Go ahead. one second? One of the thoughts I had was I keep looking, every time I go past the Avalon and what they've done with their parking uh, lot and used it as a, to be the base of a solar array. Um, I'm not suggesting that's what you all do, but I think there are ways to think about these sort of large parking lots that can be used to advance some of our Boulder Valley Comp Plan goals. Mm -hmm. If, if because it's an office park, you can't, you know, get rid of all the parking uh, needed for in commuters. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, sorry to interrupt. I think that's, those are the main points that I have. And it, it, you know, it is, uh, I think that the design looks fine. I think um, I'm perfectly uh, happy with going up to the limits of the FAR with, uh, with the, the combined site. I, uh, it seems like it's an area where we can build uh, larger uh, buildings that uh, can accommodate um, mix, mixes of uses. So I think that with that, um, just seeing, seeing that addition, the additional uses would be what I would really hope we can get to. That's my main thing. Lupita, did you want to jump in? Yeah. So I think when we, if we get to see a more um, comprehensive envisioning of that area that will help us a lot. Um, I also had this idea as we were talking about parking and remembering working in, in, a, in a company back in LA where van pooling was very common. And I'm, I'm just kind of occurred to me whether this is something that has been promoted at all in the city. Um, you know, because we talk about reducing parking and that's one very easy way to do it where you're promoting people coming together is done regularly in other cities for a long time, and I'm wondering if this is something that could even be entertained in a place like this, considering that this is primarily for commuters um, as their such thing, where we have seen this applied successfully, and this is something that could be presented or at least maybe recommended to look into for the applicant. 
And if you want a response, um, our TMP, or, or rather our um, transportation demand management, um, typically has that as an offset for parking reductions. So things like van share, car shares, van shares, um, better bike facilities, those are things that we look toward to mitigate parking reduction. So van pools certainly are part of that mix for our transportation demand management plans that are required for parking reductions. Okay, um, so, you know, I just wanted to push back a little bit about with what the applicant's representative said about locations for residential, because the planning board worked pretty hard on that light industrial areas policy 2.21, and we developed a set of guiding principles with staff for that um, policy, and the second guiding principle says um, that housing should be located in light industrial long open space and uh, greenware trail connections. So, you know, thinking of, um, we were thinking and, and talking on the record about uh, never displacing light industrial, but only adding housing where it was available, uh, where there was space or where there was additional FAR or whatever was, was allowing additional housing, but not to displace any existing light industrial and to the extent that we could locate that housing around the fringes of the industrial areas so that people could jump on their bike and get right on a bike path or enjoy the creek. Um, you know, those were the ideal locations. So, you know, not, not that, uh, again, I think I, I'm with David that I wouldn't be sitting here telling you I'd deny the application if it didn't have a mix of uses um, because of the way the code's written right now. Um, there are a lot of things I think we could do better with the code. Like, you know, this is an area where we've got some OSO, we've got some floodway, we've got some floodplain. Um, you know, it would be wonderful if the developer could be offered a, an intensity bonus, for example, if they put underslung parking in and then left half the site open and created a park-like area that would, you know, help us with flood control and create a recreational amenity for the park. But, you know, we don't have that. And, you know, when we talked about community benefit, we didn't talk a lot about developing parks, but, um, you know, this is one area where something like that would be, to me, it would be super cool, even if it meant allowing three stories on top of parking a 45-foot tall building and a .65 FAR, you ask a developer, you know, is that enough for you to build structured parking under the building? They may say yes, I don't know. So, you know, just food for thought, and that's probably beyond the scope of this discussion. So anybody else with any comments on BBCP compliance? John? I, I agree with uh, all of your comments. I'd just like to say that it seems to me that if we're being asked, as, as I mentioned before, to consider this particular property without being told about the, the master plan, which we understand is already under preparation, uh, I, think, I think this is a deficient process and uh, we're, not, we're not doing what we should be doing. The, the other thing I, I would suggest is that because I know uh, the, uh, there's probable revisions to the code coming in the, in the next year, and because of the East Boulder uh, planning efforts that are underway now, I, I think that it's very likely that there'll be changes that, that you may want to delay the, uh, the process a bit to, to see what, what happens with them, uh, to make sure that uh, what you come up with is, uh, is uh, in line with, with what the city wants. Or to participate in the process. Yes, if, if you have participation in that process is right now is the time. <laughs> and and quick point of clarification too. This evening was the first time we'd heard there's a master plan effort for Flatiron Business Park. So to the extent that that could have been folded into the concept plan, of course, it would have been beneficial to all of us in the conversation. Okay, but also I'd like to point out that um, even though we're only seeing a concept plan for two buildings or one conjoined two building building. Um, if this comes forward, it's coming forward as a an amendment to the existing site review. So we'd have to see the whole There the whole is no existing. Oh, I thought there was, okay. So, but but it would, it would be, it would come in as part of a site review that would consider 
at all least for density properties. purposes and, yep. and stuff the entire neighborhood. Yes, it, it's interesting that Flatiron Business Park doesn't have an existing scope yeah. review for the whole thing. It was annexed and subdivided and built by right. Mm -hmm. So that's sort of the unusual thing about such mm -hmm. a large area of town not having an existing site review. Mm -hmm. Okay. So anyway, John, I'm just pointing out that when it does come in, you know, obviously they're losing the the benefit of us seeing the whole the whole master plan. But when it came in for site review and this building was part of it, we would see the whole of their holdings, all well, seven buildings. I agree, but given the objective of this discussion, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. to be told that there is a master plan, <laughs> and then not to be let us look at it right. in connection with this discussion, I think is. Uh, Frustrating. Can I clarify that, or is that not allowed to? Well, you can come up. It's yeah. It's not like there are a ton of people waiting. It's not an impeachment hearing. <laughs> I, the master plan is more of just a master vision. There's not a development plan. There's not a um, you know proposed demolition of a handful of buildings. It's the developers way of trying to create a vision of connectivity where we can have like hubs for um, like outdoor plaza spaces for lunches adjacent to um, food trucks where we can have a bike parking hub where we can expand on um, TOD stops to create a hub for those places. It's not a master redevelopment plan. Um, it's more of the vision of how to enhance what we have today. Well, I, I think that's excellent. We would have loved to see that. <laughs> and I think I'd encourage you to join the East Boulder planning efforts because that's exactly the sort of input that right now would be very influential in Perfect. the outcomes there. Cool. Lupita? Yeah. I, I was just going to iterate about that because I think that this is, would be perfect for you to join, add your visioning, and also with regards to what changes will be necessary to allow that vision to come to fruition. And now that you have heard from a from a board that we do have some priorities that we would like to see, then you can hopefully you feel more free to really think bigger and say, you know, this is, would be a more in congruence with the master plan for the city and not be constrained so much by what you're allowed to do at this moment. So I think really the timing is perfect. Um, so yeah, I encourage you to join that group and work with them. Okay, so anybody have any more comments specifically around consistency with the COP plan? Okay, so in, in the code, we have a set of guidelines for review and comment on comprehensive plans, there are eight of them, and I don't wanna make the meeting go forever, so um, maybe just succinct comments if you don't have anything on a particular criterion, just don't say anything. Um, but I wanna pick up some things about site design, building design, circulation, things we haven't talked about yet, and I think this would be a, a decent structure for getting us into that. So the, the, first cri the first guideline for review and comment is characteristics of the site and surrounding areas, locations surrounding neighborhoods, natural features, and so forth. Um, does anybody have any, any additional advice for the applicant about that? Can I just one point? Yeah. Um, I know this is a tiny thing and we're only at concept plan, but there are some ma lovely mature trees uh, on the site and I would hope that we can find ways to protect them from um, being torn down for construction. I know that's way down the line, but that's my comment. Thank you. Okay, anything else? Okay, then let John. Yeah, I, I'd encourage the uh, applicant to consider potential what may happen in the future with respect to flood mitigation activities, given that these are non-certified levies uh, and there may be some movement in the future by the city or urban drainage and flood control district or other parties to alter the, the, the levies there in some way. All right, we're gonna jump over the second um, guideline because it really is basically a redo of consistency with the COP plan. Um, the third uh, review guideline um, has to do with uh, applica applicable criteria of review procedures and submission requirements for a site review, and we're probably not gonna talk much about um, the submission requirements, 
or the review procedure, but um, we can think about the site review criteria and any advice we want to give around that. Um, and I'll, I guess I'll just kick it off and say that um, as far as the uh, relationship to the neighborhood and other buildings, the architectural design, circulation and stuff, um, the, are considered in site review. I, I like the building design quite a bit. I like the, the broken massing and the overhangs and the decks and uh, the sky bridge with the deck on top of that. It's, it, there's a lot going on and, and it does a good job. I like the material palette. Um, in terms of the parking design, um, I didn't see good pedestrian ways across the parking area um, or any significant water quality and retention features in the parking area and you know given that it's adequately or over parked and planning board is amenable to a parking reduction um, doing some more in the the parking lot to create safe pathways for pedestrians getting from their car to the building um, and and some water quality water retention features within the parking area would be welcome though I do appreciate the number of tree islands that you put in there it's just you can't walk on them and it's not a safe way to get from the <coughs> parking spot to the building um, and I know it's, it's kind of conceptual, but this is the idea. So another thing is that, um, you know, if I were king of the world in planning world, I would require that all the new parking lots be, if, if they're not structured, if they're just surface parking lots, they be shaded with solar panels because it's an amazing opportunity to protect cars from a climate that's basically blazing hot and sunny most of half of the year and then, you know, cold and covered in snow most of the other half of the year and if you can protect the people's cars you protect people's investments the employees are, are not their vehicles aren't aging as much and they're not scraping as much ice and they're not sitting on red hot seats and then on top of that you're you're doing something amazing in terms of producing renewable energy and putting it into the grid so you know we need some leadership in that area and we we could use it from a new project like this um, so that's what I'll just leave that um, with you. And just to, I'm sorry to interrupt, but yeah, um, I know that we just talked about flood and uh, board members Montoya and Kirstel had some uh, excellent comments and questions about grading in the conveyance zone and flood modeling. Um, my colleague Edward Stafford was still at his desk. I sent him a note. <laughs> he offered to come over and talk about modeling in Mike flood and grading in the conveyance zone if that's uh, at all of interest yeah, uh, to I the think. board. If not, we can just take let's, the comments back to. Edward, do you want to get home? So what, you want to just come up and talk to them <laughs> now? <laughs> and I'm also surprised you weren't listening to us and that Charles actually Well, actually, I think the, he was in the parking lot when I caught him, <laughs> in all fairness, so he probably was. <laughs> was getting ready to head to the parking lot. Yeah. He was actually had been uh, meeting with another employee, so I wasn't able to listen at the time. Well, thank you. So, um, what did I understand from Charles? First, let me introduce myself, Edward Stafford, Development and Remanager of Public Works. I understand the questions are what can we do or not do as it relates to getting this multi use path in and connected to South Boulder Creek. And you're familiar, of course, in other areas where we are able to do modifications to the grading in the conveyance zone. Uh, there are requirements in both the floodplain regulations of the city and also our participation in the National Flood Insurance Program and FEMA's regulations about what you can do when you start working working in the conveyance zone, sometimes called the floodway in the NFIP language. In many of those models, which are in what's called one-dimensional, it's easy to offset the impacts from where you may change grading on one side with work in another part of the floodplain potentially, or even with minimization of what you do there. Unfortunately, South Boulder Creek is a little bit different. It was modeled using what we call a two-dimensional model. You've heard it called Mike Flood. That's the proprietary name of the piece of software that this particular one is modeled under and the regulatory model that was adopted through the city's work and then through the National Flood Insurance Program. 2D models have some really great benefits. They are more accurate than a 1D because you're looking at things in a uh, much uh, greater accuracy area. And in fact, we look at them in grids or squares that are usually I can't remember this one is, so I want to say two meter grids, um, but I may be wrong about that. So it has some great benefits there in becoming very accurate. It's also very challenging because the regula regulatory models that were prescribed from the federal side were not written to deal with what happens in a 2D model. And part of what I like to explain at times or say is if the butterfly flaps its wings here, the water moves differently. 
and any one of those cells that has any rise in it that's in the conveyance zone, and any rise has been defined all the way down to 0 .001 of a foot. FEMA has recently told us that's a rise and is not allowed under the National Flood Insurance Program. Given that and what we know from working in this model and from trying to deal with a couple of compliance cases for the last 15 years in this model, we are 99% confident that we are unable to make a grading change in the conveyance zone and create a model that will not have a rise somewhere in the entire South Boulder Creek stretch. That being the case, our advice is don't change anything in the conveyance zone. <laughs> we probably can't get there and we're gonna spend six figures in engineering proving that. Mm. So can I ask, uh, Edward, is, um, is this map accurate then that green area is the conveyance zone which includes the, this raised levee? So, Correct. So the, this raised thing is considered part of the conveyance zone. It just seems counterintuitive to me. It is, that's the boundary line of that uh, conveyance zone. In 2D modeling, the conveyance zones can look kind of strange in how they're developed in there, um, but that is what's considered the regulatory approach now. And with that, even if we were to lower an area, which intuitively sounds like, well, you're gonna cause the water to go down in 2D modeling because you're looking at it in time sequences and in much greater accuracy, what may go down in one spot may change the velocity somewhere and causes sometimes three miles away, something to rise. So let's see if I get it right. The issue is that any modification will cause any, any minute increase, 0 0.001 feet, you said? Correct. Anywhere along that line will be putting us out of compliance. Correct. So that is the reasoning behind it, not necessarily that this is not possible, or it would be better. So, okay, I'm so glad you're here mm -hmm. because, like I said, we were saying the, the purpose of doing the modeling is so that I can find us the best place, but there's a conservation of mass here that we cannot disregard. Correct. Yeah. And it's a challenging one, and, and we feel it. FEMA, well, they feel it, have said for 10 years that they hope to have more guidance and change in their regulations. We're not convinced it's happening anytime soon. It's already been 10 years. <laughs> we have also used this experience to better inform floodplain mapping, and so mapping we've done since this. The regulatory model that we adopt is not in the two-dimensional type style, but we use it to inform floodplain mapping. So there is long-term in South Boulder Creek, the desire that assuming at some point sooner rather than later in our lives, South Boulder Creek mitigation occurs that changes the floodplain, that we would remodel and remap the entire thing, and likely at that point we would be recommending to not use a two-dimensional regulatory model to create some of these challenges. Thank you. We're gonna talk about parking code changes next if you wanna hang out for that. <laughs> Thanks for the I'm invitation. <laughs> Thanks, Edward. Thank you. Did you have a question for Edward? No, I did goes? not. Okay, then go ahead. Um, I just wanted um, to uh, uh, agree with Harmon about the thought of um, using the parking lot mm -hmm. as a solar uh, collection space. Um, perhaps not the entire parking lot if that's too expensive, but I think uh, that, and maybe even think about the building as a, I, I think you said it was gonna be a passive solar building, um, but it looks like it's a, it's, a sign, it's a very large building and it's possible to think of using parts of the roof also as a solar collection opportunity. Um, just a thought. Okay, anybody else? Is um, the circulation coming up under a different one? Well, I think you could talk to that. Um, yeah, I, I think that it was good to um, read that you're thinking of the circulation and uh, uh, as the uh, potential for connectivity to the multi-use path uh, comes, I, I think that uh, having natural ways for the, you know, for the cyclists to get through the area and nice walkways uh, will be really important as you go to site review. So, um, but I, I think that it, it looks like you've, you're you thinking about that, so it's great. Can I just ask a question of staff? The open space other uh, that's on this site, it, does it uh, continue along the entire uh, uh, breadth of that area of Foothills Park? It, it does, that's right. And is that, uh, 
uh, how does the city determine the uh, the utilization of that of open space other at this point, going into the future? Probably sparingly going into the future because I think what we've learned um, over the course of the past couple years is that um, there seems to be a lot of mapping errors with OSO and how that was translated into digital mapping. Um, it's also difficult to trace the the lineage as to why these areas um, were laced with OSO or what we were hoping to do. Um, there are some theories that it probably should have been done away with when we better developed our other open space districts, but regardless, um, a lot of these appear to be vestiges. Um, so I, I don't really have a great response as to why but it's here. Can you, I'm sorry, can you just pull up the transportation, um, the connectivity maps? Because I'm, I'm just wondering if the, that OSO space could be an alternative to for uh, the multi-use path if it actually goes along the whole um, west side of the berm. Um, uh, just a thought, because I think it must connect all the way, I'm assuming it connects all the way back to 50, somewhere near 55th and Arapaho. Um, for the OSO? Well, for the multi-use path, and I'm just trying to think through alternatives to what exists, and if, if it's a big if, if the OSO um, parallels that um, berm the entire way beyond the scope of this particular project, but could that be a future uh, uh, multi-use path that would not require touching <laughs> the berm um, and the f bringing up those flood issues. It's just a, th a question. Well, it would need to meet the intent of Open Space Other, and I'm trying to get to that slide as well. It so it would need to meet um, Open Space values, and I may not have the exact, um, okay. I, I don't think yeah. this is the exact provision, but it needs to, to ensure Open Space values, and it's typically, preserve a, a native or natural environment or um, a scenic vista, things like that. So it would have yeah. to be sort of mm -hmm. wedged into that. It. But it's an interesting um, thought and it's something that we can consider as maybe we continue maybe on. Maybe older think about it as from the perspective of cre uh, creating the opportunity to reduce uh, car utilization that although that is not specific to open space, it is specific to our in our climate goals. Mm -hmm. So, anyways, just a thought. See, the one, yeah, just one one thing that I'll mention. Knowing this, uh, so the current path is on open space acquired um, all the way through, uh, and is very natural con connection from. Although it it actually um, connects to Arapaho right about Old Tail Road, and it has an underpass there. And uh, so it's, it's this very natural way to, to uh, go along and connect with the Boulder Creek path. Um, the, below the, to the west side of the levee is um, a haphazard collection of parking lot uh, uh, stuff <laughs> and uh, things that have just been put there. Uh, there's without any thought as to what that open space other designation is. So I suspect it would, you know, this is just me. Uh, I, I think it would be pretty complex to, um, to uh, orchestrate something with all those property owners, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, yeah, because yeah. <laughs> since the city doesn't own it, but it, it's still, I, li I like the thought, but uh, yeah. All right. <laughs> it's, a, it's a pretty amazing, it's a pretty amazing, I guess uh, we're allowed to maintain that, uh, op that uh, multi-use path, even though it's in that conveyance zone, uh, you, you know, so. It, it's not like it, we can't. It's already constructed. In it's already way. there. It's yeah. part oh, of the model. No, no patching of bottles. <laughs> <laughs> right. <Yes. Yeah. laughs> okay. Okay. Any other uh, thinking about nine two fourteen site plan criteria? Any other thoughts to convey? Okay. If nothing, we'll move on to the next one. Um, we don't need to talk about permits that have to be obtained. Uh, Opportunities and constraints. Let's talk about uh, this. Is really where you can dig into circulation if you want. 
opportunities and constraints in relation to transportation system, including without limitation access, linkage, signalization, and so on. Um, is there any any additional talk about circulation? I might just ask. I didn't pick up. This would be a good time just to pull up the broader map and see hmm. how it's related to. It may not bring up any questions, but it would just be helpful to see it. Thank you. And we don't. Did we? Find out, do we have a chance to find out approximately where around Arapaho the stands at center might Yeah, 55th and Arapaho, and of course I think I just closed that window. We might Hold actually on have second. it here, Charles. It's um, there. That's it. Okay, so a number four number would be two. A hoped. Two. Number two. No, no, I know number two is the transit center, but number four is the uh, light rail is number four light rail yeah it's along that orange dashed line uh -huh. yeah P proposed B line mm -hmm. yeah we'll have to pull up the link again that's okay so could we go back then to just the 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 um, map of the area that has a uh, the this went past it broad there. one yep so the um, light rail in 2050 someday <laughs> would be somewhere between 55th street and where it says bsnfrr somewhere in there yep that's correct okay. yeah that's where the number four is on the map we just looked at okay okay great seems like there are already awesome. connections that would get you there yeah. plan connections that yeah. would get you there okay so the last three of the criteria um, in concept plan review are uh, things that we've touched on or already talked about, so I'm just going to recite them, and if it jogs anything loose, then step up. Um, the sixth one is environmental opportunities around wetlands, view carters, floodplains, natural hazards, wildlife carters. Uh, seven is appropriate range of land uses, and we talked about that a lot um, already, and eight is the appropriateness of or necessity for housing, and we've talked about that. So anything that that's stirred up, or should we wrap it up? I think we've uh, already uh, blessed, blessed you with our wisdom. <laughs> <laughs> I feel blessed. <laughs> okay, so um, I just have a small set of bullets that I can email you, uh, Cindy, uh, around the comment summary to the applicant I you want it in the written in the record as well here for the audio okay so um, <clears throat> we're going to give you the applicant a, a little summary of what our salient comments are and the ones that were most oft repeated and then if you would like to uh, respond to us with any final parting words before uh, we close the matter you'll be able to do that so um, our comment includes um, uh, Transportation master plan, uh, multi-use path connectivity, we definitely need it, but we're flexible about how you produce it. Um, in terms of comp plan consistency, consider the jobs housing balance and uh, mix of uses in the master plan for the area and to meet the needs of the city as a whole. Um, consider doing more to create 15-minute neighborhoods working within the existing zoning um, and also uh, consider uh, participating in the East Boulder planning process if, if uh, that's interesting to you to potentially um, change what would be allowed in your area. Um, we would support a parking reduction when you come back for site review. Uh, well, if this board were here tonight, that's here tonight, were there when you come back for site review, they would, um, I, I can't bind the hands of future boards. Uh, well, I can't even bind the hands of these guys. <laughs> so. Um, so yeah, again, join these Boulder planning efforts and provide a vision uh, as you vision for your property. Uh, site plan compliance, protect mature trees, um, provide better pedestrian connections and parking lot design, um, solar shading, PV, and uh, we didn't touch on EV charging stations, but I think we should have um, talked about how that goes hand in hand and uh, the city's current regulations on number of EV spots per uh, number of regular spots 
is probably low um, compared to what you'll need by the time you come back in to develop the project. Does everybody agree with that? Yeah, and if, uh, um, we could also consider, you know, recommending um, EcoPaths for employees for three years as mm -hmm. part of the initial launch of the right of getting people and using mass sheltered bike parking, so things like that. Okay, great. So, uh, floor is yours if you want to respond. Otherwise, thanks for coming. If you're going to speak, come up. I think we got it. Thanks for your feedback. <laughs> okay. Thank you for coming. Okay. Does anybody need a break before we move to the, the last item? Should we the last item is purely informational, so we don't have any presentation. We don't have anything um, to add other than in Q1 of 2020, we are going to invite uh, TAB to have a joint meeting with the planning board um, to start talking about our final phase of parking code changes. There will be plenty of time to ask questions. Um, in advance of that, we'll get information out to the board before the, um, the meeting is scheduled. And with regards to the materials that was forwarded to the board um, for this meeting, if there are any questions that are generated, um, you can feel free to direct them to Carl Geiler. He's the um, case manager on that, and we'd be happy to answer them. Okay. All right, is that it for that one? That's it. Great, thanks. Um, so let's do our debrief and calendar check. Any debriefing items that anybody wants to bring up or calendar check items? This is our last meeting for the year. Okay, Lupita. Um, just to have it uh, on the record for hopefully one of our first meetings, uh, move forward with the training we wanted to get uh, on schedule. So I, I don't know, uh, Sarah may remember where it was last time we did have the discussion about it. Uh, the last time we had discussion, it was we really are eager for the gender dynamics workshop um, and we're waiting to, Lupita suggested a group on CU's campus that does this stuff and it would be really nice to, because this half, we started talking about this, I believe in September and now it's December and it's, you know, I know we're all very busy, but it shouldn't be impossible to get this on the calendar. Oh, thank you for the refresh. So, yeah, for the reminder. So, yeah, we will definitely look into that. And it so, because yeah. it's going to be all of us, it should be, it oh, yeah. would be a public meeting, correct? I mean, is it a, pu it's, that's not a, is it a public meeting since it's going to be all of us? Well, or is it a work? training that you go to, that you'll be going to? Is that what it is, Lupita? Yeah. It's a training that yeah, you... Yeah, so the, we, um, we requested to have some training, and the question was who will deliver it and, you know, when to schedule it. So I proposed a group on campus, but I believe that Charles had also had looked into potentially something. It, it wasn't Charles. No, it wasn't Charles? It was Chris. Chris. Chris, yeah. I'm sorry. Let me get with Chris. Um, I will get with him mm -hmm. uh, next week, and yeah. I'll talk with him about it. I just sent him a note reminding him. Yeah, that, yeah, that, yeah. Because I don't remember what what that was on that end, but I know that I was going to look up the other one. Thank you for the reminder. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. I will, I will definitely get into contact with him. We'll talk about it. Appreciate it. Anything else? Uh, David. Um, yeah. Uh, uh, do we? Um, when do we usually know what the time frame of the summer recess is? We don't. That doesn't come clear until. Once we know what the uh, council's recess is then we are usually able to set ours. Okay. So um, they sh will probably be setting their recess dates, I would assume, around their retreat. Yeah, I would say early next year. Well, so maybe by February or March yeah. kind mm -hmm. of time frame. Okay, yeah. cool. Mm -hmm. Thank you. You bet. Okay. Yeah. Um, any matters from the city attorney or staff? Nope. All right, then I think we'll just uh, call this meeting adjourned. Thank Yay. you. Thank Welcome. you. Good job. Thank great. you. Thank you. Live from Paris on Fold by Cat. Well in English. Mm -hmm. um, the cartoonist Cac has this one saying that uh, Emmanuel Macron has three options. He's portrayed.